the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. When the mass is moving a certain direction, try to stand back and appraise it as objectively as possible. Because history as a guide will tell you that the majority is always wrong. The majority is being clustered and focused by central planning in such a way that is driving new and different behaviors. And those behaviors ultimately are not sustainable. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. David, you've had a chance to think about relationship this weekend. I know that you had gotten a call that you had lost a family member and you jumped on a plane and went out to the service, but you just shared some thoughts with some of the folks here at the office that I thought would be worth reviewing just in reference to legacy and relationship. Well, Larry was a solid guy. And I mean, the family, what they remember of him, not that he was a successful banker. He was that uh, retired at age 55, died at 79, spent quite a few years <laughs> shucking pecans and playing golf, reading books, uh, reading books. Yeah. His father was a member of the Atlanta Fed and his entire career was in banking. But it just it reminded me that how we spend our lives with whom we spend our lives, the conversations that we have, the relationships that we advocate for the places where we invest relationally, this is where real impact lies. Right. Because honestly, it doesn't matter square footage, the size of a bank account. I mean, all of these things, they're the niceties of life, but guess what happens to them ultimately? They go away. Well, and you had a particularly fond spot in your heart for him because, you know, your dad, honestly, amongst bankers and amongst, I would say, sort of the elite class is sort of an oddball. And your uncle, even though he was also in the banking industry and fit right into that, he was a real champion for your father and his, I guess, unique ideas about the economy. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting looking at sort of the expectations of my father coming into that family. Yeah didn't really fit. I wonder why. Well, and he didn't really represent social progress. <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he was regress in the family story. And so, yeah, Larry was very generous. He was a very adult and we've always thought highly of him. Transitioning to this week and seeing Hugh O'Brien and Phyllis Schlafly both pass away. Hugh O'Brien, of course, the Wyatt Earp from the 1950s and Phyllis Schlafly, very influential in uh, social politics from a conservative perspective. Well, and Hugh O'Brien, sort of an all-American cowboy, and Phyllis Schlafly, your dad knew her. Both champions for particular causes. And just reflecting back to what inspired Hugh O'Brien, it was an encounter with a doctor in Africa. Hmm. And that encounter made him reflect on his life and think, there should be more purpose in what I do. Yeah, I've made some movies. Yeah, I've made a few million he bucks. He was sort of a millionaire playboy up to that point, right? Right. And all of a sudden he wanted his life to matter. Yeah. And he made a very different set of choices, say the last 30, 40 years of his life. Very interesting to see someone driven by purpose as opposed to just finding a place in the cultural milieu, which he had already done, mm -hmm. which he had already done through his movies. So I thought it was an interesting weekend coming through Labor Day, uh, just kind of reflecting on the value placed on different people and the things that they've done. And, and we could point at the biographies of each of these people, including my uncle, but really what has mattered most, if you were to see sit at you know, the funeral service for any of them is the way in which relationships were developed and mattered and where there is a lack of relationship, there's bitterness and sadness and yeah. where there is flourishing relationship, there is a deep sense of satisfaction and gratitude. And you can tell a difference. I, I don't want to say I like going to funerals, but there are interesting observations that you can make at any funeral about the qualitative side of someone's life, which is fascinating because, you know, as we've talked about GDP, as we've talked about economics, as we've talked about the things that today's social scientists try to measure right. and put a value on, actually the things that we care most about in life are difficult to put a value on. That's part of our conversation with Diane Coyle last week was the difficulty that those who calculate GDP 
have in putting value on things that, to some degree, transcend value as we can calculate it. Well, and she brought out that, you know, her dissatisfaction with what we measure, it's not only inaccurate and liable for some manipulation by the powers that be, but it's also just not measuring the important things. You know, she talked about the Victorians, the way the Victorians 100 years ago made decisions was based on a hundred years looking forward or 200 years looking forward. You know, you build a Victorian type of building back in the 1800s. That building probably is still standing today. It's the same thing with institutions. You know, I, I was talking to a client, Dave, about the GDP discussion with Diane Coyle and the client, very loyal listener to the commentary, you know, she brought up, she said, you know, it reminded me a little bit of what Tomas Sedlacek was talking about as far as are we measuring what's important? Are we really looking to the long term? I think of the new book that you have written that will come out in November on legacy. That's what you're really pleading for people to look at at this point is to stop looking at the short term, look at the long term. We could go on and on about legacy, but it's important for our listeners to continue to try to realign their thinking that way and maybe look through those glasses. While I was in Mississippi, I was reminded of my cousin who's in the mortgage business, and we had a, a conversation while I was there. He's actually in uh, Louisiana. I love listening to him describe the corporate culture that he has through many years developed. As you know, there was recent floods, major floods in mm -hmm. Baton Rouge and other areas in Louisiana. And just interesting to see how they kind of took that in stride. You know, 40 of the folks that he works side by side with every day, the houses were destroyed. Wow. And they needed to get those people back into a position of having hope, of having perspective for the future. And, you know, the company came in and just basically said, look, we're going to help you. They, they had their houses gutted. They're in the rebuild process. And, you know, within a week, they had 95% of their employees back to work. And within two weeks, 100% were back to work. Wow. And this was originated by the company, not the government. Yeah, that's right. Something else that I thought was interesting as we were talking, you know, employees right now in their business, the mortgage business, they're making more money than they ever have before. Mm. Okay. And yet this is something that he mentioned, which I thought was fascinating. And yet loans from the company, this is actually prior to the flooding and everything, but loans from the company are the highest they've ever been. And what were the reasons for that? He cited health care costs and a rise in rent as the two killers. Hmm. We're talking about rising prices, which are basically crowding out a potential increase in consumption. And this goes to what Albert Edwards at Society General has pointed out, that the U.S. consumer, the U.S. consumer is the crotch for U.S. GDP growth. Hmm. Without consumption growth, we lose GDP growth. And in fact, if you take out the consumer to any real degree, you swing from positive economic growth to negative numbers. And so as I'm conferring with my cousin, he's amazed that even with an increase in pay in his industry, people are more strapped now than they were back in sort of the halcyon days of 2005, 6, and 7, when the mortgage business was booming then. Yes, they went through a crunch period, but actually, they're back, baby. They're back. Yeah, and so wages are rising, but they're not rising fast enough to keep up with health care, and then you brought up rent. Right. So it's essentially health care costs on the rise. You've got Obamacare, which is crushing the consumer by transforming healthcare into an increasingly expensive proposition. Mm. So here I am on my return flight from the South. I'm having a candid conversation with a gal. I didn't get much sleep for about a 72 hour period, 48 hour period to be frank. And it's, but I'm an extrovert through and through. So yeah. I'll feel compelled to chat with the, the person next to me. And she's more than willing to share that, look, things are tight financially, and she's willing to take the fines for non-enrollment in Obamacare, because what she said is she can't afford to be in the system. Right. Which is contrary to what it was supposed to be originally. I know. So there's this growing divide between the interests of the state and the individual. Think about this. Yeah. I can tell you how the individual acts and chooses when they're put under pressure. Unfortunately, I can also tell you how the state responds. And if you go back to our commentaries with Robert Higgs, mm. the Leviathan will do anything it has to to stay alive. Yeah. So we are getting ready to see, in regards to our monetary system, I think we're getting ready to see similar things. Top-down controls, cashless society stuff. Go back to Larry Summers. 
you know, he, he was an advisor with the Obama administration before that president at Harvard University. And before that, I mean, we've talked about him for many years because of his contribution to the Summers Barsky thesis right. and his sort of understanding of gold and the relationship between gold and interest rates. Well, and he's calling for negative interest rates to last for a long, long time. Well, what he's suggesting is that there's secular stagnation and the economy is going to be in the doldrums for a very long time. And then when you think about that, you think about current monetary policy, and yes, low to negative interest rates become an enduring reality right. if, in fact, that is the case. Probably along with quantitative easing. Right. So we have to see. Have we had the labor market improve? Sure. To some degree, it's improved. But we have to see if wage increases are sufficient to offset the increase in rent, the increase in health care costs. This is not hard science here, but anecdotally, talking to my cousin, and I'm excited for him. His business is doing well. But, you know, he's just put out a little mini crisis with the floods, which right. were impacting a large number of employees. Well, and he talked about health care, but he also brought up rent is rising. Why is rent rising? Aren't we in a deflation at this point? It's ironic. I mean, <laughs> we were talking just about business related things. And he says, so we have a reasonably big business today, but I'm 100 basis points away from being a small business. Hmm. And so interest rates move in one direction or the other. And the mortgage business is dramatically impacted by the cost of capital. Well, why is rent on the rise? Look at low rates and think about this. You have low rates which spur asset price inflation. Yeah, the stock market's been doing just fine. Thank Real estate has recovered and moved to new highs in many places around the country. You've got old property owners who are looking at the value of their properties and saying, well, now's not a bad time to sell. They monetize the assets. They exit the market at all-time highs. They cash out. Now you have new owners who are staring a low-return asset in the face. And to boost yields on returns, guess what happens? They start raising rents so that they can live for a longer period of time and take in sort of the vagaries of the markets, which might be not having full occupation, et cetera. And that's what they're trying to do is create a little bit more cushion so they can deal with what you sometimes see in real estate vacancies. So it, what I'm suggesting is this is a sign of malinvestment or an exaggerated interest in income producing properties with any yield right. as a result of traditional savings and investment vehicles looking so unappealing because of what? Because of the prevailing interest rates being so low. So you either have no yield on the one hand or you say, well, I guess I could have a real asset with an income stream as well. Yeah, I'm paying a lot for it, but tell you what, 4% beats nothing. 3.5% beats nothing. And so we're seeing the transformation of the property sector as a result of low interest rates. Well, and you know, you talk about malinvestment. I mean, when the central banks keep interest rates artificially low, like you said, there's a point, negative interest rates cause people to vote with their feet. You know, you brought up how safes in Japan, I mean, you could barely get a safe in Japan. They, they couldn't get them in there quick enough because the Japanese were pulling cash out of the banks. Well, that's right. So back in July, we were talking about the demand for gold on the increase as a consequence of, you know, trying to stimulate the economy using negative rates. Right. And the response from the consumer being, why should I have money sitting in the bank or why even sit in yen when I can have gold or worst case, yen sitting in a safety deposit box? At least I'm not getting taxed via a negative interest rate. Well, Wall Street Journal reported this last week that German savers are doing the same thing, moving from savings accounts to home safes. And again, this mirrors what happened in Japan earlier this year. But it's important to recognize some of these strains and connect the dots. We mentioned some of the articles from Ken Rogoff and some of the academic work being done by Michael Woodford, who wrote Interest in Prices. And we've got Rogoff with his new book out this month called The Curse of Cash. Right. He makes this elaborate argument that we should avoid cash altogether because of its many nefarious uses. Don't you know the underground economy is driven by it? All kinds of bad things happen from human trafficking to arms trafficking. We just we would have a cleaner world if we weren't dealing with cash. Right. And he's right on those things. OK, all of those things occur with cash. But like Otmar Ising said, who was the head of the European Central Bank for seven years, 
Cash is coined liberty. Well, and, and so this is, I think, what people have to remember. When someone presents an argument, you may say, okay, well, that was a compelling argument. But why was the argument being presented in the first place? Right. And this is what ends up being so disingenuous about Rogoff's book. His real purpose in writing the book is to create a popular appeal for something that academics say they need to continue foisting negative rates on the financial system and eliminate this opt-out that we've already seen in Japan, that we've already seen and is being reported by the Wall Street Journal in Germany, where they're basically saying, look, if we're going to be put under the gun, if we're going to be put under pressure and we're going to be taxed via negative interest rates, taking financial repression to a new extreme, you know, I've seen studies where if you applied the Taylor rule, to the crisis dynamics of 2008 and 2009, we could have had rates as low as negative 9% in order to accommodate inflation, deflation, and the machinations in the financial market. If they market. were using this policy up to that point, but it's only started in 2014. Right. Well, Rogoff saying we need these tools in place prior to the next crisis, and we must have them because what we're really fighting is evil. It's just interesting to me that he can sort of create an argument around the idea that here we are, not only are we rock stars as central bankers, but we're also going to be superheroes. And to his defense, we may not agree necessarily on his cash position, but he and Carmen Reinhart wrote an excellent book called This Time is Different. There is an understanding of economic history, you know, the past defaults of the last 700 years of various governments. He's seeing this and he's saying, well, gosh, maybe we don't have to default. Maybe we just take people's right to their money away. Well, you're right. I remember late 2009, I was on a plane to Buenos Aires, Argentina, right. and that was the book that I wanted to take with me and read while I was on the plane. An overnight flight, good 10, 12 hours to read. And man, I learned so much. I have a debt of gratitude to Rogoff and to Reinhardt for the insights they brought in the study. And listen, they're both very good academics. I'm just saying there might be a blind spot on Rogoff's part in thinking that what he's doing is solving one problem and not seeing that he's actually creating other problems in the process. And yes, it may be an elegant solution to get rid of cash. Those are his words, an elegant solution. But there are different things that get put in motion from a sociocultural perspective, right. which are outside of the elegance of the economic math. Well, and you've talked about equations and how you can sometimes try to fix an equation, but actually make the problem worse. And in this particular case, you're right. You take the ability of people to make a choice to walk with their cash away. The central bank equation becomes far easier. There's more than a small bit of irony in that central bank policies have created conditions that to some degree undermine recovery and increase risk in the sector. That applies to real estate, but ultimately it applies to banking as well. I mean, listen, you've got the CEO of Deutsche Bank who's saying, look, negative rates are killing us, killing us as an institution. Deutsche Bank is up against the ropes. Why? Well, they're up against the ropes for many reasons. Hmm. But his argument is that interest rates are certainly not helping. They're hurting us as a financial institution. So again, central bank policy steps in to help the financial institution. Now they can't get out from what they're doing, something of a trapped position, if you will, and it's hurting the institutions they were originally going in to help. Again, I think people are having a hard time with connecting the dots between policies that are put in place and ultimately seeing the socio-cultural impact, the change in market behavior, if you will, as a consequence of that. You have that with Dodd-Frank as well. Yeah, you know, The Economist magazine had warned about Dodd-Frank that there were a lot of unintended consequences and confusion and huge, huge amount of verbiage that could be hardly analyzed correctly because of the complexity of it. You know, speaking of the money markets that at this point, you know, all the years that I've used money markets, I just expect a dollar per share. You know, I put a dollar in and I expect it to at least be a dollar when I take it back out, along with hopefully a little bit of interest. Right. So if money markets are the equivalent of cash just in a brokerage account or in an IRA, that is changing this fall as a consequence of Dodd-Frank. If it is a money market fund, which has anything other than treasury bills, right. that money market fund is going to have a floating value. Now, I mean, share prices, if you've grown accustomed to thinking of them as $1 constant value, great. But understand that in a zero interest rate environment, these funds can barely exist without taking more risk, which quite frankly justifies a floating share if they are taking more risk. 
But I think it's also important to keep in mind that the safety conscious investor looks and says, well, maybe I don't want to have commercial paper. Maybe I do want to have treasury market exposure. And so the only way that I can have the guaranteed dollar value in, dollar value out without fluctuating value in between in my money market fund is to buy treasuries. Well, it's an amazing gun to the head if you think about it, because you're sitting there going, well, gosh, all right, commercial paper might get me a little bit of interest, but I want that dollar per share guarantee. Only the government is allowed to guarantee a dollar per share guarantee. How convenient. It ends up driving yields in the treasury market even lower or perhaps even more negative. And at the same time, it shrinks liquidity in the commercial paper market by seeing those safety conscious investors step out of commercial paper or other forms of liquidity that go into a money market fund and into a treasury only fund. It sounds to me like this is going to drive interest rates up in commercial paper, Dave. And all of this is compliments of your negative or low interest rate policies. Well, Dave, you brought up Deutsche Bank and they've been in the news pretty consistently now for the last few months. They're crying foul on the low interest rates. They're looking at their own books and saying, we can't survive this. But their own analysts right now are saying, if gold would be left alone, it should be 1700 bucks an ounce right now. And it's an interesting conclusion to come to. You know, Their analysts highlight the correlation between central bank balance sheets and the price of gold, concluding that any increase in the scale amongst your four largest central banks, so we're talking about European Central Bank, the U.S. Fed, the Bank, the Bank of, of Japan, Japan right. and the People's Bank of China. So you're talking about the big boys club, but the four largest central banks, you've seen their balance sheets in aggregate grow by 300% since 2005. Hmm. And that should reflect itself in the gold price and the dollar gold price should be right around seventeen hundred dollars is their conclusion now i think it's very interesting this is not a part of their research but if you look at the st louis fed mm -hmm. annual meeting at jackson hole this last couple of weeks what were one of the takeaways sub note one of the papers presented and this is why footnotes are always important but one of the footnotes in one of the papers presented says look we don't have to take rates negative but we can have a similar economic impact if we expand the central bank balance sheet by other assets, but we should consider expanding the bank balance sheet at the Fed to $10 trillion. Which is doubling or more. More than, than doubling, doubling from $4.5 trillion today. And so, I mean, again, keep in mind what we're talking about. I think there's some rationale to what the Deutsche Bank analyst is suggesting. Yes, a correlation between the gold price and central bank balance sheet size and scale. So if gold is allowed to behave as a currency... That's what happens. Right. Two exceptions to this correlation were 2008, when gold sold off, even as central bankers started to get really active in the market. That was temporary, and ultimately the correlation came back into line. And then 2013, when central banks intentionally massacred the price of gold in an attempt to break down the psychology in that market and bolster or boost interest and belief in the economic recovery meme at the same time. Mm -hmm. So again, we already have correlation reemerging and the gap to fill is about a $400 gap to fair value. So if you want to keep in mind that the Fed is moving towards that idea of a trillion dollar balance sheet, you can do the math. Central bank activism is going to be a critical driver of private party gold purchases over the next three to five years as gold remains one of the only viable opt-outs from a financial system which is growing in terms of its leveraged risk, which is built upon an economic base that is dwindling. Think about it. This last week, you've got Hinjin Shipping. This is one of the largest shipping companies out of China. Right. They just declared bankruptcy. That's right. Why? Well, look, in a period of growth, if you have lots of debt, your growth is sort of covering over the need to pay the finance monster, right? But if... If your economic activity slows at all, if your business activity slows at all, and you've got too much debt, guess what? Debt takes you out of the game. And so we've had a slowing in global economic activity, the shipment of goods and services from Asia to the United States and to Europe. And guess what? Now, one of the big boys fails. Again, it's just <laughs> we just need to keep in mind the risks involved in high degrees of leverage, which is to say when you have lots of debt in the financial system, you're moving on to thinner and thinner ice. Well, I'm talking about central bank assets at $10 trillion over with the Federal Reserve. You asked the question, what would the gold price be? And I think it's worth repeating a, an unusual thing that a person really ought to get a piece of paper out and list right now. Go back to the 1970s. Gold started at $35 an ounce. 
right? Yep. So you write 35 down, and then above that and to the right, just go ahead and write $190, because of course gold rose to $190 by about 1974, and then it fell. Close to half. <laughs> yeah, it dropped to 105. Right. So write 105 down. Uh, Two-year down cyclical low line. bear market takes it to 105. And then finally, as everyone knows, we saw the Russians invade Afghanistan. We saw the Carter years. We saw the inflation. But by the end of the 1970s, we saw 850 gold. So that's the last figure you write down. Now, here's the unusual thing, and you've brought this out, David. Add a zero to each one of those, right? $350 gold was where we were at in the early 2000s. 1900 is where we peaked a few years ago. Back in 2011, yeah. yeah. And then we dropped to 1050 roughly, which is adding a zero to that 105. And we don't know where this game ends, but in a game of musical chairs where you have the array of central bankers playing the music, how do you guarantee that you have a chair? How do you opt out of the whole game if you think it's just a dangerous game to begin with? I think gold begins to see the kind of play that we saw late 70s, 78, 79, 80, 81. In that time frame, the swing vote in the market, which was the investor, came in in a significant way and took what was a very inelastic market. When you look at where most of your mind gold goes each year into jewelry, into industry, what have you, it's a very thin market to begin with. A little bit of buying drives the price up. A little bit of selling drives the price down, which makes 2013 so significant because it was a lot of selling and it wasn't a market practitioner. It was central banks hammering the gold price right. to make a point. And you can see that on the other side, too, as we've seen, and I think we'll see over the next couple of years, taking us exponentially higher. Why? Because again, it doesn't take very much at the margin in terms of buying to be compensated for or adjusted for in terms of the price moves. Well, now let's look at what happened in 2013. Gold wasn't just hammered, but the stocks were very actively purchased at that time. The asset purchases that we were seeing were somewhat backed by Federal Reserve largesse. Now look at the stock market now, okay? Mark Faber has pointed out in the past, when a stock market starts range trading after making new highs, it very well may be a top. Well, where are we at? Where are we going? That's what the market's asking when it's range bound. Where are we at? Where are we going? Is there a catalyst for decline or is there a catalyst for growth? Right. And in the absence of either, it just kind of sits there and goes nowhere. Which we've been in the 18 and a half range for a while now in the stock market. If you're looking at the summer months, this has been a very dry, boring, slow, range bound summer. Mm -hmm. And you know what does that open up? Could the market go higher? Certainly it could. But what would that catalyst be? It has yet to be revealed. I can think of at least a couple of things that might cause a significant decline coming into the end of the year. If you look at the last two handoffs, you know, we just finished the Olympics and mm. there was some interesting things to learn about passing of the baton. Well, the passing of the baton between the Democrats and the Republicans to the Bush administration, you had a 40, 45 percent decline in stocks on that baton pass. Hmm. Because of market uncertainty about what would change, what policies would be implemented and what the ramifications were for asset values moving forward. I think I know where you're going with this because 2008, look at that. We went from the Republicans to the Democrats. Right. And again, a 40 to 45 percent decline coming through October, November, December, with those being very, very dicey months. Hmm. Yes, we could see the Fed raise interest rates 25 basis points later this month, but it still makes me think that we could have a potentially disastrous October in equities. You can hardly call 25 basis points points, tightening in terms of monetary policy. But I think that the handoff from one party to the next, the handoff from one party to the next, it's enough to be very disconcerting for the global equities markets. Well, and you know, there's tensions rising on globalization and globalization is merely just the ability of countries to do business with each other. You know, we have the G20 meeting this week and I don't know if you noticed this. I know a lot of people did, but when Obama's plane landed in China, they did not roll up a ladder to let him off. He had to come out a different exit. There was a red carpet, but there was no ladder. <laughs> There's tension right now. I mean, the Philippine president, he doesn't like Obama. The Chinese are treating him pretty coldly right now during the G20. Harold James, one of our guests in the past, worries about the breakdown in globalization because when that happens, a lot of times violence increases. If you haven't read James's book on the end of globalization, you have to. That's a must read. Not one to have on the shelf, but 
a well-worn copy on the shelf is better. Hmm. And he brings some very valuable historical insights into that. And he wrote about that almost eight years ago. Keep that in mind. This is a book that's getting some age on it. And he said then what is happening now? Globalization is on the ropes. The G20 is trying to reinvigorate and encourage trade cooperation and financial flows. You've got the Chinese who, you know, the center of their world and attention is the new Silk Road what they call the One Belt, One Road Project in China. It opens up possibilities for growth between China and the European continent. And of course, it's a policy that's good for China. But you've got to look and say, you know, in terms of U.S. economic dominance, do we want to compete with the Chinese? Policy is good for China. Right. It's at odds with U.S. economic dominance. I think they should pursue it. Of course they should. If you're a Chinese person, well, that's of course. Right. I'm just suggesting that the U.S. State Department officials are not going to make it easy. You've got the inclusion of 4.4 billion people that benefit or participate in or touched by this project called the New Silk Road. Right. And it basically creates the center of the economic universe as the Chinese economy. They're talking about it being twice what the United States economy is, you know, within a matter of two decades. So if you saw a project that included 4.4 billion people and affected, ultimately involves dozens of countries, would you? As the State Department, would you be underhanded from behind the scenes? I think we're going to be. Mm. And I think the day we get caught being underhanded with the Silk Road project, you want to see cold relationships go icy between the U.S. and China? There you have it. Strangely, Harold James points out in his book, you know, when tensions are rising and things aren't going well, people sort of become nationalistic. They start drawing their protection in, you know, start talking about building a wall. OK, that becomes a more popular type of theme. And so, you know, immigration seems to be a very big deal when people are hurting or they're strapped. That's very true. And, and you see the same theme developed in Niall Ferguson's books, several of his books dealing with World War II, where he basically says it's not always economic decline that causes an emphasis on immigration and a focus on the other, differentiating us versus them. But just any economic change where you have someone who is advantaged and someone who is disadvantaged, mm. that's enough. Economic change itself creates enough social cultural tension to exaggerate a trend towards xenophobia, racism, or in this case, just a concern of, will I have a job if we keep on bringing people in who may ultimately displace me? Immigration playing on that fear to some degree. Sure, because the pie is shrinking and you're wondering if you're going to get a piece. So G20, the conversation is, of course, how do we reinvigorate and encourage cooperation? The problem is the fly in the ointment is the global economy is not growing as it once was, which means, as you say, the pie is beginning to shrink. And all of a sudden, we have immigration and domestic national concerns coming to the fore. And that ends up displacing a political will, which would otherwise be focused on being more magnanimous and generous with everyone. Right. Increasing trade, increasing trade deals and capital flows. Instead, you're seeing them be constrained. Well, and it's not just immigration. At this point, when we're talking about shrinking pie, it's also plots of land. And, you know, Scarborough Shoal has been under a lot of controversy and lines are going to have to be drawn at some point, possibly militarily, as to what side the United States and other countries take. Either China, the Philippines or everyone else who's looking at that area saying, you know, that's mine. Yeah, if you want to understand Asian politics and potential geopolitical conflict over the next three to five years, you need to get out an atlas and you need to look at the Scarborough Shoal in the South China Sea. And you also need to look at a map of the Nine Dash Line and just Google it, Nine Dash Line, and look at what the Chinese are claiming as their territorial waters. And when you see... When you see the map of the nine dash line, you'll understand how preposterous the claims are hmm. because it basically is encroaching on what you would expect. You and I, with no political axe to grind or geopolitical axe to grind, would say, gosh, that's awfully close to the marine territory of six or seven different countries. But, you know, back to this issue of immigration, Merkel lost significant ground over the weekend due to immigration. The German economy is not booming. If it was, she could manage this issue. And because it's not, we have immigration as a major issue. It's a major hot topic. And in some local elections, her party just got destroyed over mm. the weekend. So, look, we've got the premier in China who's at the G20 meeting. 
and he's saying, look, we know we have a rise in protectionism. That has to be addressed. That's a major concern. We know we have a highly leveraged financial market, and he's not just giving commentary to the Chinese economy, but he's also talking about the global financial system. And he's identifying two really key points, because these two key points, when you bring in protectionism on the one hand and a highly leveraged financial system on the other, and a contracting global economy, which he did not include as a third variable, right. this is a little bit like a mule cart pulling nitroglycerin down a street full of potholes. Yeah. <laughs> which pothole is the one that causes the thing to blow up? Just back away. Watch the baton handoff from Obama to whomever takes office next. I think we are front row to some very interesting market volatility over the next 90 to 120 days. Well, and some of the indication that we got over in Germany with Merkel's posture on immigration, we're starting to see that show up with Trump. Over the weekend, we're starting to see the numbers now. They're saying that Trump actually has a lead over Hillary. This is the first time ever. Well, why is that? You've got these same issues showing up time and time again. When my dad and I were in Hawaii this last year, we talked about Duterte. The newly elected president came in in May in the Philippines. Yeah, because your dad lives in the Philippines. That's right. Both my parents live in the Philippines. And it's interesting because he described him as the Donald Trump of Asia. Huh. No nonsense guy. Doesn't take crap from anybody. Has his opinions and isn't afraid of stepping on toes. And if a job needs to get done, he'll do anything he can to get the job done. Don't get in his way because it might get you shot. And it's funny because at a popular level, he was swept to power. Very unexpected. Very unexpected. But people want a can-do guy. Somebody who's no-nonsense and has a plan. And this is the case in the Philippines. The Japan Times reported over the weekend that he is absolutely livid about what is happening in the Scarborough Shoal. Because remember, again, you've got contentions between China and the Philippines as it relates to these territorial waters, too. Right. And why is he upset? Well, the evidence in most recently is that the largest flotilla yet collection of boats sitting out there on the Scarborough Shoal includes the kinds of barges which you would use to begin construction projects. He sees the hammer and nails showing up at this point. Well, right. They've already been told by the folks in Europe, back off, you don't have a legal claim. Now they're just saying, look, we don't accept your jurisdiction here. And in all likelihood, they're beginning a building project. Now, if you want to stop someone from a building project, it's going to take force to do it. Mm -hmm. Because they've already acknowledged that law and the international courts have no bearing on this. Right. So now the only way to stop them is by force. Well, talk about tensions. I mean, he called Obama something that they can't print in the paper. It wasn't as bad as son of a motherless goat, but it was in the same genre. It, right, right. And so Obama at this point won't meet with him because he was <laughs> uh, dishonored, I guess. Now, you may not think about the Scarborough Shoal as significant if you're age 40 and above, but it's going to be very significant for anyone 18 to 30 because our involvement in a military conflict, conscription of soldiers may have everything to do with the nine dash line, the Scarborough Shoal and this maritime fight in the South China Sea. So again, who are the interested parties? Where is there a greater likelihood of hot conflict? You've got something that is developing in real time there. And by the way, does this get layered into what happens to the financial markets? What happens to the U.S. stock market, global equities market, emerging equities markets, and even the price of gold? Well, of course, because right. remember, the critical variable, the critical variable late 70s was not economic or financial, which ended up driving the price of gold from, say, 275, 300 up to 800. Right. It was strategic and geopolitical. On any economic equation, you should have stopped at 400. Right. It was fairly priced. Why did it more than double its justifiable levels? Because of geopolitical tension. So why are we interested, always interested in a commentary and a dialogue that includes the economic, financial, the political, the geopolitical, because they all overlap in a very interesting and ultimately in terms of price action, compelling way. Well, and it's not just Asia. We saw the unification, supposedly financially, of the European Union continent. You know, we saw Brexit that passed a few months ago, that Brexit is going to be the British exit out of that system. But now, now we're seeing France. Uh, that's a big part of the European Union. Yeah, so Frexit. Le Pen. Le Pen is like Duterte. 
again, what you're seeing is populism in different colors, different shapes, different sizes, different genders even. And guess what? They're all expressing some level of discontent amongst an emergent middle class, Mm -hmm. or in the case of the United States, a middle class which was well-developed, which is getting squeezed more and more. And my takeaway from talking to my cousin in the mortgage business is that you're dealing with middle class families who are living the good life, but living right on the edge from paycheck to paycheck. And if you increase their expenses by a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars a month, it means they need to borrow a thousand, two thousand bucks by the end of the year just to make ends meet. They're just on the edge. And it creates some underlying tension because they don't feel like they're living extravagantly and yet they are now living beyond their means. Why? Because things are changing around them which are driving prices higher and there's nothing within their power to do that. So why would the middle class in America be interested in Donald Trump for the same reason that Filipinos are interested in Duterte and you're seeing a growing number of people interested in Marine Le Pen in France? Again, you're talking about changes which are intolerable to a middle class segment. And could we see Frexit, as you said, just like we had Brexit, a French exit from the EU? Right. Anything is possible. Anything is possible because politics can change with the wind in the blink of an eye. And it just depends on what the pressure points are as to how people respond to them. Because if you go back to Brexit, remember that Ireland was very critical of this and was like, no, you should not. You cannot. It's not in your interest to do so. But when you align self-interest in just the right way, you might even find Ireland balking at staying in the EU. You know, we had a tax ruling which went against Apple. And of course, Apple is one of these multinationals that has a hybrid domicile, and they don't really exist in the United States or in Europe via Ireland. They have a domicile which, in theory, exists somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean, which gives them the ability to not be taxed the way a U.S. corporation is, not be taxed the way a European corporation is. And this hybrid tax structure, now the EU is saying, no, 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 you're about $14 billion behind on your tax payments. And now they're putting their sights on a number of other U.S. multinationals as well, who've been doing this sort of tax arbitrage, if you will, in having multi-domiciles and whatnot. So let's say, for instance, that Ireland is no longer a tax haven within the EU. Does it make sense for Ireland to reconsider their loyalties to the EU when their corporate partners begin to exit in mass because the only reason that they were there was for tax bennies? Take away the bennies, take away the corporations. Now, all of a sudden, Ireland is being put under the gun and Ireland has to ask the question. Do we really think it's as good an idea to be a part of the EU? And it's not just Ireland. You know, we've talked for years about Portugal, Italy, Spain, Spain. I mean, the European Union could be a thing of the past unless they do something fairly quickly. And this is I'm not meaning to sound conspiratorial here, but think about this. What events would unify Europeans and solidify the theme of centralization versus fractured national interests? If we have those events occur, it's worth asking, how did they occur? By whose direction? Well, that's one thing that you can always count on throughout history. You always want to, anytime you're in a discussion with somebody, you want to say, okay, what is your motive? What game are you playing? Now, it's not that we're all playing games, but we all have a self-interest, that we all have a goal. And so, you know, to criticize the state for actually just sticking up for their own goals is a misunderstanding of history. Yes, we may not like that, but they're going to do that. I mean, look at the central bankers right now who are saying, hey, these negative interest rates actually have worked. You just maybe don't see it. Right. Well, Kuroda has having second thoughts on the other side of that equation on negative rates. He would say, actually, it's damaging the financial institution's profitability. And it's something that maybe we'll keep in place, but I don't know that we can do any more. We've kind of come to our limits and and I don't know that it's working. That's a little bit like a cigarette manufacturer saying, you know, we're thinking possibly cigarettes may not be the best thing. Right. So he's actually acknowledging that he's now moving in a contrary fashion to what central bankers were doing in the post 2008, 2009 period. After the global financial crisis, they wanted to fortify financials, which are under pressure so that the economy could continue to grow. Now the economy's flat. Financials are under pressure from the very groups that attempted to save them in the first place. Mm. And Kuroda's at least acknowledging, not sure that this is the right step to take. In contrast to Stanley Fisher, who this last week says, 
I think negative rates are working very well. Quote, they seem to be working in other countries. And then this is really fascinating when you step into the mind of a central banker like Stanley Fisher. Bright guy, by the way, very bright guy. He managed the Bank of Israel, the National Bank of Israel, through the global financial crisis with real finesse. Hmm. So I don't think I'm being overly critical here, but do think about this mindset, okay? What is working and what does it seems to be working mean well, to who? Yeah. Stanley for Fisher? Who? I quote from this last week, well, clearly there are different responses to negative rates. This is what he says, Kevin. If you're a saver, they're very difficult to deal with and to accept, although typically they go along with quite decent equity prices. But we consider all that and we have to make trade-offs in economics all the time. And the idea is the lower the interest rate, the better it is for investors. Hmm. Now, Again, if you're wondering what gets the ire of the man in the street, it's a rationale that says, well, hold on a second. So the money that I saved for retirement, which was going to supplement my Social Security income, which now no longer gives me any income whatsoever, unless I'm willing to take extravagant risk, you're telling me, you're telling me that it's okay. On balance, if I'm suffering, it's okay. Right. You're about to wrinkle the general public in a way that you haven't seen wrinkled in a long time. Again, I think Trump, he is a creation of public sentiment. Right. You might ask yourself, how can this happen? How can a Donald Trump be someone who is possibly electable in the United States? Because he reflects the United States. Right. And if you're a Democrat, you may say, well, he doesn't reflect my interests. No, he reflects what people feel right now. Well, and Bernie Sanders on the Democrat side, this is why Bernie Sanders will not go away in the minds of the people on the Democrat side. He also is a reflection of the United States, not his policies as much as what he represents to a dissatisfied audience. Well, Dave, as a social shift is occurring, the people who are going to lose, you know, we talked about motivations. What is the motivation necessarily of a central banker or a government official who represents the establishment that's now being offed by the public? They're going to scramble. They're going to do anything they possibly can. I mean, the European Central Bank has been so busy buying up debt, trying to keep this movement from occurring. It's running out of things to buy. And the markets are being manipulated here. I mean, think about your job, Dave, even even as an analyst, how can you make good judgment calls on investments when somebody from the top who's trying to maintain the status quo as the status quo is falling apart manipulates the markets the direction they think it needs to go? A generous interpretation of what central bankers are trying to accomplish is I just want to make things better. Right. And they're looking at all their tools and saying, how can we make things better? But again, I mean, whether it's changing the nature of money market funds and driving capital from commercial paper into treasuries accidentally, maybe not accidentally, but let's just assume accidentally, or even changing the flow of capital from actively managed capital pools to passively managed pools. You know, Vanguard's seeing $200 billion in inflows this year after a $236 billion inflow last year. From a social standpoint, just what does this mean? What it really means is that we're in this twilight zone where thoughtful analysis of valuations, valuation metrics doesn't matter anymore. Asset managers of a professional ilk cannot add value when the markets are being rigged. Right. And so Vanguard is a passively managed fund. In other words, people are saying, look, I don't want you trying to time this thing. I want you to leave it alone. Nobody can analyze anything anymore. People are not looking back far enough, however, to say that actually there is value added in the analysis process. And yes, it's true. Analysis does not matter when markets are being rigged. Right. But on that basis, you're seeing a massive shift of capital. People saying, well, then I'm not going to pay for it. Right. Okay. But I mean, what is in essence happening here? You're moving to autopilot at exactly the wrong period of time. When the second shoe drops in the global financial crisis, that is part two of what began in 2008 and nine, who's going to be left to blame? Right. Who's going to be left to blame? If people can't stomach blaming themselves in the absence of professional asset managers, because remember, if somebody else is managing your capital and, it, and something bad happens, guess what? You point the fingers. Oh, I can't believe this. But if it's you managing it through passive vehicles, guess what happens? Right. You're talking about a once in a generation exit from the financial markets, which may mark a generational low in terms of an interest in investing at all. Like back after the 1930s, where people were like, I'm never buying a stock again. Right. So you take the central planners out of the equation. And yes, you find a massive need for professional management. But what I see, what I see in some of these socio-cultural shifts is an insight that comes from my dad. Right. 
I'm stuck on an adage that he said at the dinner table in almost every speech I ever heard him deliver, which was the majority is always wrong. The majority is always wrong. If you look at the mass currents of people, whether it's in the markets or in politics, when the mass is moving a certain direction, try to stand back and appraise it as objectively as possible. Because history as a guide will tell you that the majority is always wrong, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And so that's what I see taking shape. The majority is being clustered and focused by central planning in such a way that is driving new and different behaviors. And those behaviors ultimately are not sustainable. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or you can give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 